Christmas. Operation Christmas Child is one of the great stories that's unfolding in our lifetime. I want the children of the world to know, I want their parents to know that God loves them and he wants them to be with him in heaven. That's what it's all about. Every single box is important because it connects two hearts. That of the person who packs the box and that of the child who receives it. A child in need of that love. When I look at these boxes, I just see thousands of smiling kids. Where appropriate, children who receive shoeboxes are invited to learn more about Jesus. We develop the greatest journey, a 12-week discipleship program for the kids that make decisions for Christ. Yo les voy a compartir lo que aprendí a mis amigas, a mi papá y a mi mamá. This is just so awesome to give these children the opportunity to experience the love of Christ in a way that they've never experienced before in their lives. kids that have nothing. These gifts will mean everything in the world to these children. And we're going to give them in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we are excited to be kicking off OCC this week. So if you look over there, you see a pile of boxes. And this is our opportunity to join in with Samaritan's Purse uh, for the Operations, Operation Christmas Child Ministry, I guess. And uh, it is, it is an, a great opportunity because we're not just sending presents around the world. We're not just a bunch of people in America trying to play Santa Claus. We're a bunch of people in America who love Jesus so much that we're willing to take a little bit of our time, a little bit of our cash, and send these things across the world, not so that we can meet this need for a kid yeah, so they can have maybe the only Christmas experience in their life. That's awesome. But we're doing this so they have the opportunity to hear about Jesus. And then beyond that, to be discipled, to be connected with a church, to grow in their faith. That is the goal. And so we're excited today to be kicking this off. So as you leave, make sure you grab one or two or five of those boxes. Uh, there's a list inside the box of the different things that you want to pack uh, for each different age. Uh, there's rubber bands on it uh, as well. So you can rubber band the box when you're done. And then we just have to make sure that those boxes are back here November 18th. But in order to help us with that celebration... After second service today, the OCC and the Panama teams are going to be out here, and they're going to be doing a potato bar, which means potatoes with all of the good stuff that goes on top of the potatoes and hot dogs for the kids. And you can come here, you can eat a great lunch and fellowship with great people as we serve our great God. So don't miss out on that. Transition. Grab your Bibles. Go to Ecclesiastes chapter 8. If you don't have a Bible, uh, there should be one in, uh, under the seat in front of you. You can grab one there. Uh, and Ecclesiastes, if you find Psalms right in the middle of the Bible, just go a little bit to the right of that and you'll find Ecclesiastes. A uh, small, maybe not too commonly read book, but we've been having a lot of fun, right? Drudging through in misery. But it's fun. So here we go. Um, and as Cole mentioned a couple weeks ago when he preached, uh, part of reading through Ecclesiastes is the realization that what Solomon is doing here is he's being a good teacher. That he already told us things before and now he's repeating them. And he's rephrasing them so that we will remember them. Right? For those of you that are, that are teachers, you know that. It's like You can't just tell a kid something once because then they forget. In fact, I had a funny experience. Uh, Wednesday night we had youth group. They're high schoolers. And then uh, I got a ride home with a, with a friend, and one of my students got a ride home with us. And I was like, okay, so what's the one thing you learned tonight that, that, that is really important to you? And he said, it's the one thing I forgot. And I was like, 
That's why we teach it over and over again. Okay, here we go. So what Solomon is doing here, he's not telling us necessarily something that we haven't seen yet, but he's repeating it. He's rephrasing it. As Cole pointed out, he's, he's turning the screw, making it a little bit tighter. It might hurt a little bit more, but it changes our hearts as we think about it again, as we refocus on what he's doing here. So hopefully we remember the lessons he's teaching us. So grab your Bibles, Ecclesiastes chapter 8, and I'm going to read, starting in verse 1. Solomon says, Who is like the wise, and who knows the interpretation of a thing? A man's wisdom makes his face shine, and the hardness of his face is changed. I say, keep the king's command, because of God's oath to him. Be not hasty to go from his presence. Do not take your stand in an evil cause, for he does whatever he pleases. For the word of the king is supreme, and who may say to him, what are you doing? Whoever keeps a command will know no evil thing, and the wise heart will know the proper time and the just way, for there is a time and a way for everything. Although man's trouble lies heavy on him, for he does not know what is to be, for who can tell him how it will be? No man has power, over to, power to retain the spirit or power over the day of death. There's no discharge from war, nor will wickedness deliver those who are given to it. All this I observed while applying my heart to all that is done under the sun, when man had power over man to his hurt. Then I saw the wicked buried, and they used to go in and out of the holy place and were praised in the city where they had done such things. This also is vanity, because the sentence against an evil deed is not executed speedily. The heart of the children of man is fully set to do evil." Though a sinner does evil a hundred times and prolongs his life, yet I know that it will be well with those who fear God because they fear before him. But it will not be well with the wicked, neither will he prolong his days like a shadow because he does not fear before God. There is a vanity that takes place on earth, that there are righteous people to whom it happens according to the deeds of the wicked. And there are wicked people to whom it happens according to the deeds of the righteous. I said that this also is vanity, and I commend joy, for man has no good thing under the sun, but to eat and drink and be joyful, for this will go with him in his toil through the days of his life that God has given him under the sun. When I applied my heart to know wisdom and to see the business that is done on earth, how neither day nor night do one's eyes see sleep, then I saw all the work of God, that man cannot find out the work that is done under the sun. However much man may toil in seeking, he will not find it out. Even though a wise man claims to know, he cannot find it out. Let's pray. Father, these words are heavy, but so are the truths that you want us to hear. And God, I pray that the weightiness on our hearts would become joy as we realize that you are the God who upholds us, who raises us up under the, the pressures and the burdens of this life, and who carries us through. And God, I pray that holding on to your truth and holding on to your joy would take away the frustration and the stress of this life. You'd help us to walk through faithfully with our eyes set on you, serving a greater kingdom and a better cause. In Jesus' name, amen. How many of you guys have seen the movie Fiddler on the Roof? Okay, a few. All right. In a moment, I'm going to show you a clip from that movie. If you've never watched it, this has nothing to do with the sermon. You're not going to learn anything from this. It's just an, an example, an illustration of what I think is going on in Solomon's mind here. Because Solomon is trying to weigh things out. And he says, well, there's this. And then he says, oh, but, but wait, there's that as well. And he's going back and forth and back and forth. And uh, the title of this morning's message is The Good, the Bad, and Reality. We know what's good. We know what's bad. Reality means that things don't always end up the way that we think they should. Now maybe, as you watch this clip, this will remind you of the way you, you think, and maybe, if you're like me, the way you talk to yourself and trying to weigh out the options. So take a look at as Tevya struggles with something. I command. On the other hand, what kind of a match would that be? With a poor tailor? On the other hand, he's an honest, hard worker. But on the other hand, he has absolutely nothing. On the other hand, 
things could never get worse for him. They could only get better. <laughs> they gave each other a pl And maybe you should go watch the movie, because it's, it's a great movie. A lot of lessons for us to learn, and it's hilarious. But I love the way he ends up with like four or five hands, right? And, and this is how we think through things. Well, here's this decision I have to make, and here's the, the pros, but on the other hand, here's the cons. We go back and forth and back and forth. And I think this is what is happening with Solomon. As he says, this is what's good, <laughs> but on the other hand, reality steps in and makes a mess of things. And so we're going to see, as we walk through the first part of this chapter, the benefits of being good. We all know that we should be good, but what are you going to get out of it, right? Well, we start off in, in verse 1. And Solomon says, Who is like the wise, and who knows the interpretation of a thing? A man's wisdom makes his face shine, and the hardness of his face is changed. And as I was studying this text, I was like, can we just stop there? In this like, gloomy book, here's a ray of sunshine. It, it seems good. It's happy. The wise man is a happy man. And let's just stop, walk away, and reflect on that for the day. But there's like 16 more verses in the chapter, and we've got to walk through all of those too. But one thing I saw in this verse alone, right, is that that second half, a man's wisdom makes his face shine, and the hardness of his face is changed. Have you ever known someone that was so smart, they were boring? Like they were so smart that like their, their life seemed empty of joy and happiness, but they were smart. And what Solomon is saying here is you can have all the knowledge and knowledge can make you boring or stern. This is what I struggle with, right? Not that I'm that smart, right? But, but as I learn things, right, you just want to point out what's wrong in everything. And, and you become stern or you could get angry. And that's no fun for anyone, even yourself. And you realize you're a boring person. And, and hopefully your knowledge is transformed into wisdom, which then softens you up a bit. Because rather than just knowing what's good and what's wrong, you're able to discern between the two. And you're able to help other people see that. And it, wisdom allows that knowledge to make your face shine. It lights up a room. So rather than being the person that's so smart he's boring, you're the person that is a ray of sunshine even when the world is gloomy. When your knowledge could help somebody, you're not just pounding them with it, but rather you're lifting them up and guiding them gently so that they can shine brighter with you. And this is something I have to work on because the more I know, right, the more I want to teach with just this, this is the way things are, students, just do it. And that doesn't normally work with students, does it? Or any of us, really. None of us really like being told, just do this, right? Just obey, right? Bottom line is that's how the sermon's going to end, is just obey. But wisdom takes that knowledge and allows us to make our faces shine with the joy of who God is. So what Solomon is saying here is, don't just get knowledge. Let the Holy Spirit transform that into wisdom in your life that can change things. And he continues on in verses 2 through 4. says, I say, and I love this, it seems kind of self-serving, right? The king here is talking, and he says, I say, keep the king's command. Of course you do. You're the king, right? Because of God's oath to him, be not hasty to go from his presence. Do not take your stand in an evil cause, for he does whatever he pleases. For the word of the king is supreme. And who may say to him, what are you doing? And I thought about that. I was like, it is kind of self-serving for Solomon to say these things. But isn't it what's best for everyone? When we listen to the rules, and when we follow the rules, and we listen to the authorities, isn't it what's best for everyone? So when the authorities say, don't do that, rather than saying, well, you just say that because you're in charge, maybe we should listen and be like, it's best for me. I was thinking about this. Have you ever felt guilty for, for doing something for yourself? Good. Someone else out there is like me, okay? They're like, so, so for some of us, we spend so much time focusing on serving other people that we fail to take care of ourselves, and ultimately we end up a mess because we simply didn't take care of ourselves so that then we could serve other people better. And we feel guilty, or maybe we sit on the other side and we begin to judge other people because we look at what they're doing and we're like, well, that time could have been better spent doing this, 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 because we have better plans for them, right? But when, when we do what's best for us, 
normally it's also best for everyone else. You can take this to the self-serving extreme of only looking at what you want to do and what you're trying to get out of life. But we've already covered that in previous chapters. It's not about serving yourself, but it is about taking care of yourself in the midst of serving other people. And this is why we need rest. This is why God said, work for six days, rest for one, and worship me on that day. Because we need to take that time off of everything else for him and for us. This is why we need vacation. Have you ever felt guilty about going on vacation? Because there's so much work to do, right? There's so much work to do. But does the work to do ever end? No. And if you don't take a break, then you're going to burn out, and you will end far before the work does. So relax. Let up a bit. And as Solomon is saying here, what's best for the king is also best for the people. And it might sound self-serving, but what he's saying is listen and follow the rules because it's best for everybody. Even though he benefits from it, so does everyone else. And as he says some of these things in, in these, these three verses, it just made me think about who God is. And what Solomon is saying really is focused on the under the sun, the on this planet idea. And is the king really supreme? Well, in America, we don't have a king, and so we would, that would be foreign to us, right? But back then, in most cultures, the king was worshipped as God. In Israel, he wasn't. But still, the king was placed there by God, and every word that came out of his mouth was law, was rule for the people. So he really was supreme. But we know that only God is actually supreme. And, and as he says some of these things, like, Who's going to say to the king, what are you doing? And it reminded me of, of Isaiah as God is talking to us and he says, I'm the potter, you're the clay. Who are you to tell the potter, what, what are you doing? Who are you to look at your life and say, God, I don't like the way you made me. But God made you. And he has a plan. He has a purpose for you. And it's our job to simply trust in his plan and his purpose, knowing that what he has planned for us really is the best for everyone. We also look at this and we say, man, earth's rulers might seem supreme, and we might not like that. Has anyone in here ever disliked a government official? <laughs> All right, there we go. Hey, guess what? God put them in place. You can go to Romans chapter 13, 1 Peter 2, 13. It doesn't matter if we don't like them. We still have to listen and obey. And as believers, when we listen and obey... It's still best for everyone, especially for ourselves, as we try to share our faith with other people. Can't really do that as well, raging and rebelling in anger against whatever it is that we don't like about the current politician. I'll leave it at that. In verse 5, he, he gives us some, some other basic wisdom here. What's another benefit of, of, of being good? Well, you stay out of trouble, right? Verse 5, whoever keeps a command will know no evil thing. Does this always work out? Of course not, right? But if you follow the commands in general, right, if you're following the laws, you won't get in trouble by the law, okay? If you're doing 75 in the 75, and your car is doing just fine, and there's no issues, are you going to get pulled over? Probably not, okay? Maybe there's a police officer who's just having a really bad day. It happens, but when you're doing 85 in the 75, and your tail lights are out, and your license tag is expired, and you get pu pulled over, who are you going to blame? Oh, the, the cop. No! Okay? If you're following the commands, generally, you're not going to get in trouble. The wise heart will know the proper time in the just way. And this is what we saw in chapter 3, that... There is a right time for basically everything under the earth, and there is a wrong time. And the wise man whose face is shining knows when to do this and when not to do that, right? He knows what is right at the right time. This is what wisdom is. It's not just knowledge, but the ability to put that knowledge into action in the right time, in the right place, in the right way, so it benefits everyone, including yourself. And Solomon says, hey, if you do these things, if you're following the commands, you're going to stay out of trouble. It's going to be best for everybody when you, when you just do what you know is right, right? Again, as we talked about last week, the wise man is the righteous man. 
And when you do these things, you can have joy in your life. And then we wrestle with reality. Here comes the but. But on the other hand, verse 6, for there is a time and a way for everything. We acknowledge the truth of that. Although man's trouble lies heavy on him, for he does not know what is to be. There is a right time, and there is a right place for everything. <laughs> but we mess everything up, don't we? We talked about that last week, too. We know that this is what we should be doing, and then we scheme, and then we come up with our plans, and we mess it all up. This is what impatience, impulsiveness, and indecision do to us. I know what I should do, and then we start puzzling through all the options. We start thinking about, what are the pros and cons of this? But if you know that this is what you should do, do you need to be weighing the pros and the cons? There are times in our lives where we have to weigh out the pros and the cons. We have to look at this. We have multiple different options. We say, okay, how is this better? Who does this benefit? Does this thing glorify God? But when it comes down to just a matter of, is this morally right? Is this righteous? Is this what God wants me to do? Or is this thing wicked? You don't have to weigh out the pros and the cons. And Solomon says, we know what is right, but man's trouble lies heavy on him. Because we don't know what the future holds. No one knows what's next. And as we look at our lives and as we try to puzzle through and control every facet of our existence and be in charge of what we're doing and, and all of that, Solomon's response is, you don't know what is to be. For who can tell him how it will be? You don't know the future. And no matter how hard we try, no matter how many times we sit down at the whiteboard or the chalkboard or the piece of paper and we, we try, try to list out everything, we try to puzzle out all of the future consequences of this decision, we will never fully know. And maybe a question we can ask ourselves is this. What are we held more accountable for? The action itself or the consequences of it? Sometimes I, I do ethical dilemmas or moral dilemmas with our students. It's a lot of fun just to get them puzzling through it. If you feel like you're a righteous person, you have a good hold on morality, just let me know. I would love to give you some of these and see how you puzzle through them. And one of the things that we, we run into constantly is people trying to answer this question by the possible outcomes of the future. But the bottom line is, if it's sin, it's never right. And it's never wrong to do right. But it's also never right to do wrong. And we try to weigh out all of the possible consequences of what we're doing here, and we miss the bottom line of, is this right or is this wrong? And we're looking at the wrong thing. Because no matter what, you can never know all of the possible consequences of this action. I was thinking through this even yesterday, just contemplating my, my dad's life. My dad is a pastor. He went to Bible college. He went to seminary. Uh, he pastored a little church in Washington. Then they moved to New Jersey. Now they're in North Carolina. And, and I was looking at my life and the way my life was shaped and changed by the decisions he made. And I know that there's decisions that my own dad made that he would go back and he kind of say, I don't know if I did what was best for my family there. Or I'm not sure. But he made the decision. See, impulsiveness always gets us in trouble. <laughs> because normally, if it's that, you know, um, grocery store, last minute grab the candy bars by in our life, that's minimum, right? That's, that's not important. But when you do that with bigger questions in your life, like, I just feel like it and I go that way. Normally, those things don't end well, do they? When we let indecision rule our lives and, and we're trying to weigh things out until the moment has passed us by, we end up with a lot more regret and we end up not really living at all. And Scripture has plenty of examples of what impatience does to us. 
Think about Abraham. What happened when Abraham was impatient? The Middle East conflict exists because of Abraham's impatience, right? Nobody knows everything that's coming. Nobody knows what's next. And so live in the moment that you're in right now. Ask, what does God want me to do right now? And walk faithfully in that knowledge. Do what is right anyways. Because nobody knows the future and no one escapes. Look at verse 8. No man has power to retain the spirit or power over the day of death. There is no discharge from war, nor will wickedness deliver those who are given to it. We have a, a phrase, right? The only things in life that are sure are death and taxes. Well, back then, taxes weren't maybe as much of an issue. They would say, and the only things that are sure in life are death and that you're going to fight in the war if you're a guy. Because most, most cultures back then, if you were a man and the nation was going to war, you were going to put down your hammer and tongs or, or your, your plow or whatever else it was. You were going to go pick up the, the weapons of war, and you were going to march into the front lines at the king's command. Israel actually had a lot more lenience on this. Um, there's examples from history of, of both uh, Darius and Xerxes who responded to a father, right? Uh, there's a father who requested, he said, hey, I only have one son left. Please don't make him go to war. And I believe it was Darius in this situation, sent troops, killed the son in front of his father and said, now he gets to stay home with you. It's horrible. Now in Israel, they actually had some lenience. In fact, if you go to Deuteronomy chapter 20, what you find is that if, if you had just gotten married, you didn't have to go to war. If you had just planted a field that you'd never harvested, you didn't have to go to war. If you had just built a house that you hadn't really lived in yet, you didn't have to go to war. It's pretty amazing. But in most ancient cultures, if the nation went to war, you went to war with them. And there was no discharge until the war was over. And for all of us, there is no escaping death. In this life, one of my favorite questions to ask students is, what happens at the end of your life? What happens at the end of your life? You die, right? Normally you think, well, you retire. And you, no, 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 the end of your life, the last thing you do is you stop living, right? And so for these cultures, they said, man, there, there's, there is nothing certain except for death and war. You can't control the future. You don't know when you're going to die. You don't get, get to escape these things. And by the way, if you try to escape them through wickedness, oh, it'll catch up to you. And so we get to the last point as, as he's wrestling with reality here. He says, by the way, rulers are fallen. All this I, I observed, verse 9. All this I observed while applying my heart to all that is done under the sun when man had power over man to his own hurt. The bottom line is men were never supposed to rule over men. God created Adam and Eve so they could rule over the plants and the animals and the, they, they could help creation worship God. But then sin entered in, and every time man has power over man, every time you have ru men ruling over men, sin is going to follow. And are there good, godly, righteous rulers and politicians? Yes, there are. But are there a whole bunch of them that aren't? Of course. When men rule men, evil is bound to be a part of it. Which brings us to the next point. The wages of wickedness. Solomon puzzles through. He says, okay, here's the benefits of being good, <laughs> but reality. And he says, oh, here's the wages. Here's the results of being wicked. Then I saw the wicked buried. They used to go in and out of the holy place and were praised in the city where they had done such things. This also is vanity. Why do we praise evil men? Think about that. You're like, we don't praise evil men, don't we? Have you ever rooted for the bad guy? Have you ever looked back in history and thought that that, that mafia boss or, or, or that, you know, ancient ruler, man, that guy was cool, right? Alexander the Great. If you, if you like history, you've done this, okay? And we end up ro rooting for a bad guy. We end up praising evil. And it says, what happens is 
at the end of someone's life, you have this ruler that during their, their reign, people are like, oh, I don't like this guy, I don't like this guy. And then they die, and oh, everybody's so sad, and they forgot what he just did, and all of that, and their giant funeral, and pomp, and, and, and all of that stuff. And we praise evil men. And it's sickening that we become engrossed in these tales of wickedness and evil. All you have to do is turn on the TV. What's on the news constantly? Good, uplifting stuff? What, what's what's the, the nature and the content of crime shows? And yes, at the end of the crime show, hopefully the bad guy goes to prison, but how much time do people spend watching these crime shows learning about how to do evil? How to get away with murder? I was talking with a friend about this. He said... That he had been watching a show and he had to be like, no, I can't watch this anymore because in his mind, he, was, he, he and his wife began thinking, oh, well, this is what they should have done. Romans 16, 19 says, but I want you to be wise as to what is good and innocent as to what is evil. I love a good story, a great story of good versus evil. And I love it when good wins and evil loses and the good guys are obviously the good guys and the bad guys are obviously the bad guys. Those are my favorite kinds of stories because then I know who to root for and I know that good wins and triumphs, just like it happens in this story too, and there's no confusion. There's none of that gray area. I'm a black and white person and I'm not, I'm not fond of, of the grays. So Solomon says, hey, this is what's happening People look at the wicked, they forget that they've been wicked, they praise them. This also is emptiness, this is vanity. So he says, because the sentence, verse 11, because the sentence against an evil deed is not executed speedily, the heart of the children of man is fully set to do evil. Here's a parenting tip, all right? If you still have little kids at home, spank them quickly, okay? They do something wrong, here's your lesson on crime and punishment. They do something wrong, you don't wait till later, you deal with it right then. Because if you don't, then the immediacy of the consequence escapes them, and they begin to think, I got away with it. Even if they get disciplined later, they begin to think, I got away with it. And he says, because of this, the heart of the children of man is fully set to do evil. I did a, a report when I was in high school about uh, capital punishment. Not really a, a popular subject in any, in any place or situation. But I, I studied it. I researched it. I looked at it. And it's like, okay, if we want to eliminate capital crimes, what is the best solution for it as history has shown us? Well, in our modern culture, it would be live TV broadcast executions. Am I saying that that's something I would cheer for? No, of course not. Am I saying that that's something we're going to see in our culture? Definitely not. But when crime is dealt with speedily and justly, people are a little bit more afraid to commit crime. Look at our culture. What do we do with criminals right now? We send them to prison. We clothe them. We feed them. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this subject. I'm just saying that it doesn't create a culture where crime becomes less. So in our own families, don't let your kids get away with it. We want to save what lies ahead by spanking what lies behind. Okay? Save their future by spanking their rear. Because the bill comes due, nobody actually gets away with anything. Verse 12 Though a sinner does evil a hundred times and prolongs his life, yet I know that it will be well with those who fear God because they fear before him. But it will not be well with the wicked, neither will he prolong his days like a shadow because he does not fear before God. And as Solomon is looking at this, and he's looking under the sun, and he's saying, you know, I know, I know that God will judge them. And maybe Solomon didn't know where or how or when, but guess what? We have a whole lot more Bible than he had back then. And if you go to Revelation chapter 20, here's what we find. At the end of time, when this universe is destroyed, every person that has ever lived will stand before God. And God will open up the books of their lives. 
And every single one of us, when God looks at the book of Mike's life, I will be condemned by it. That there is no person whose good deeds will outweigh their bad. But then there's another book that's open. It's called the Lamb's Book of Life. And as long as your name is written in that book, then God tosses the other one and says that one doesn't matter. But as we look at this world and we think they're getting away with it, they're getting away with it, they're getting away with it, we have to remember that this life is not all there is. And even if justice isn't perfectly carried out here, and it never will be, they won't get away with it forever. But on the other hand, verse 14, there is a vanity that takes place on earth. Even though we know that the wicked will be judged and the righteous will reap the benefits of goodness, on this planet, there are, uh, that there are righteous people to whom it happens according to the deeds of the wicked, and there are wicked people to whom it happens according to the deeds of the righteous. I said that this also is vanity. It's empty. It doesn't make sense. Life isn't fair. Found this quote yesterday. If you expect the world to be fair with you because you are fair, you're fooling yourself. That's like expecting the lion not to eat you because you don't, didn't eat him. I would say, if you actually think that you're fair, that's where you're fooling yourself. Because none of us is actually fair. All of us are schemers trying to turn whatever it is to our own benefit and good. And we think about what's fair, you just I have to remind my, my, my kids and myself of this all the time. What's fair is not Jesus dying on the cross for your sins. That's not fair. And expecting this world that's covered in sin to be fair, it's just not going to work out. And so, yes, there are righteous men who die before their time, and there are wicked men that should have perished. But we're not the ones who get to judge between the two. Life isn't fair. And honestly, this sucks. And Solomon looks at that. That's kind of where he gets stuck. It's not fair. But how much more unfair is it if there is no eternity? If there is no eternity, then there's no reason for us to do what is right and not do what's wrong. If there is nothing after this life, if there are no eternal consequences, then do whatever you want. This is the problem for the atheists. No matter where they try to get morality, if there is no, eterni no eternal existence, if there is no life after this one, then nothing really matters. You're made of matter and you don't matter. So you should do whatever pleases you right now in this moment. Verse 15, if nothing really matters, then just enjoy life. Eat, drink, and be merry. Eat, drink, and be merry. Solomon says, verse 15, I commend joy, for man has no good thing under the sun but to eat and drink and be joyful, for this will go with him in his toil through the days of his life that God has given him under the sun. And this could seem like a ray of hope. Just have joy. How much joy can you have? How much light in your heart can you have when you look around and everything is darkness and everything is unfair? And so trying to say, just be joyful, it doesn't work. Trying to pretend that life is just an eternal summer picnic. That is the stuff of daydreams. Those are the thoughts that were in our heads as we sat there in math class and stared out the window. You can only stare out the window for so long, the assignment is still there. And the more you daydream, and the more you just try to be joyful in the midst of the darkness, the more the weight piles up around you, and when you finally get back into reality, it tears you apart. Eat, drink, and be merry is not a concept that only Solomon dealt with. And Solomon isn't telling us here, just chase joy for itself. Because he's already told us, you can't chase anything for its own, own sake, or you will end up miserable. Isaiah deals with this as well. In Isaiah chapter 22, God is speaking to the Israelites, and he says, In the day that I called for mourning, and for repentance, and for sackcloth and ashes... You carried on with parties, saying, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. In Israel, Jer Jerusalem was surrounded. And God was calling people to repent. 
And they were like, ah, we're all going to die anyway, so let's just party it up as long as we can. If you read Revelation, this is what you see people doing as God pours out his wrath on the planet. Well, I know we're all doomed, so enjoy it while you can because tomorrow we die. In Luke 12, 19, Jesus talks about this. He talks about the wealthy fool who has harvested crops. His barns are full, and so he's like, man, I, I'm so overloaded with wealth. I know what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns, and I'll, big, I'll build bigger, newer ones, and I'll fill those up too. And God says, fool, this night your soul is required of you. You can't just eat, drink, and be merry. Because that last half, and tomorrow we die, has some pretty significant results. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, If Jesus Christ wasn't raised from the dead, then we may as well just eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. And that is the key for joy. The joy that we chase isn't joy on this planet. The joy that we chase is because Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. And we're not here just trying to enjoy this while we can. We're not here just trying to live in a daydream until we cease to exist. We are here chasing an eternal summer picnic that will actually last forever. It just doesn't start in this life. We might not experience it here. Eternal life does begin right now, and we can get glimpses of it as we serve Jesus, but we look forward to a place where there will be no darkness, no pain, no tears, none of the vanity and the emptiness that we see in the pages of Ecclesiastes. We look for an eternity that's free from toil and uselessness, it's free from daydreams because we actually live it every day for all of eternity. And as Solomon is studying and perusing and trying to wrap his mind around all of this stuff, he comes down and he says, man, studying is a waste of time. Look at verse 16. When I applied my heart to know wisdom and see the business that is done on earth, how neither day nor night do one's eyes see sleep. Have you ever worked so hard that you just skipped sleeping for the night because you were, you were working, right? studying? I mean, not because you're like me and you're a procrastinator and you just had to stay up because you had six months to write a paper and you waited until it was due tomorrow. But like you're just trying to get things done and you stay up and you're working. It says, then I saw all the work of God that man cannot find out, or but man cannot find out the work that is done under the sun. However much man may toil in seeking, he will not find it out. Even though a wise man <laughs> claims to know, he cannot find it out. And this is the dilemma. This is the vanity of science. That every time we find a new solution to something, we create more problems. Every time we find an answer, aha, I learned this amazing thing. We had this discovery. And it results in all a bunch of more questions. And we can chase it and chase it and chase it. And there is nobody that actually has all the answers. And sometimes... We have that idea, mostly it's just in comic strips now, of like, you know, the guru that's sitting up on top of the mountain because he's so wise. And the people, they're climbing up the mountain, and then they go to him and they try to get wisdom, and he's like, I just want a cheeseburger. Right? He's like, all of this, but it doesn't matter. Martin Luther King Jr., I love the way he, he talked about this. He says, science investigates, religion interprets. Science gives man knowledge, which is power. Religion gives man wisdom, which is control. Science deals mainly with facts. Religion deals mainly with values. The two are not rivals. They are complementary. This is where so many people in our society have gotten lost. They chase science, and they lose Christ. Or they chase religion for religion's sake, and they lose logic and reasoning. And brothers and sisters, believers in Christ, believers in the word of God, this is what's so awesome about Christianity, is it is the worldview that makes the most sense of our yearning for religion and our knowledge that we are supposed to worship someone and something and the truth and the facts of reality. And it takes logic and reason and religion and it places them all together. And we worship God in spirit, in passion, and in truth. So Jesus said, 
God is spirit. John 4, 24. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. You can't know all that God is doing, but you can stop trying to control everything. And you can humble yourself and you bow down and say, God, I, I trust that as you control things, it really work out, will work out in my best interest as well. If you're still struggling with that and you really think that you can figure things out, go to Isaiah 55. Read the last, I don't know, five chapters of Job. And rather than trying to be God, learn to enjoy trusting God's goodness. Last week I concluded by saying, think about it. I'm not going to say think about it this week. I'm going to say live it out, okay? How do we take the truths from this chapter? How do we take the, the, the wrestling with reality? How do we take good and bad? And how do we figure these things out in light of the word of God, in light of who Christ has called us to be? Three things, right? And I put them in a kind of a poetic, rhymy form for you. Do what's right. You just stop there. That's good enough, right? Do what's right. No matter what, you'll never know all of the consequences. So in this situation, do what's right. Do what's right. Let your face be bright. If your knowledge is causing you to be boring, humble yourself before God. Stop trying to control things and worship him. Do what's right. Let your face be bright and help someone else shine the light. If you're looking at your life and you say, I'm a righteous person. And generally, I'm not perfect, right? Because if you're perfect, go back and watch last week's message, right? Go back one chapter. But I'm a good person, and generally, I do what is right. Awesome. Are you boring? You say, no, no, no. I do what's right, and, and I shine with the light of Jesus. I am joyful. Great. Awesome. Now find someone else and help do that. Help them do the same thing. I'm going to have the band come forward. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray in just a moment. God is the king. His commands are supreme, right? Those who listen to him, even though we struggle, even though man's trouble will lie heavy on us as long as we are still on this planet, we will conquer because Jesus Christ conquered. And our hope, our joy, it doesn't lie in political changes. It doesn't lie in making ourselves better people. All of that comes as we look forward to a kingdom with no enemies, no end, and no worries about what's on the other hand. Let's pray. Father, you are good. You are so good to us. And this life is hard. This life is full of things that we cannot comprehend, of questions we can't answer. And God, there are so many things that people around us are chasing, trying to fill their lives with a false happiness, a distraction. God, I pray that that wouldn't be us, but that you would help us to keep our eyes set on you and that our hope would be in eternity and that we would begin living that out now, that we would do what is right, that we would shine with the light of who you are, that our hearts would be full of joy. And God, that we wouldn't stop there, but we would be looking to someone else and inviting them into our lives and showing them how to shine with your love and your goodness as well. God, I pray that our love for you and our love for each other would be a beacon of joy, a beacon of life change that begins here, but spreads throughout Camp Verde and the Verde Valley, that we, you would use us as silly, as confused as we are, that you would use us. In Jesus' name, amen.